Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I am Jared Overson. I've been talking a lot about uh, credential stuffing and how our applications are being manipulated uh, the way they were expected to be used. Uh, but before we get started, should we trust me? Uh, should you trust me? And should you just walk out of the room right now? Uh, because there are lots of other good talks here. I am Jared Overson. Uh, Director of Engineering at Shape Security, uh, where we have built things that specifically defeat a lot of large-scale automation and fraud. I'm a Google developer expert, uh, mostly focusing on esoteric web tech uh, and automation via Puppeteer, uh, Playwright now, uh, Selenium, and uh, just the low-level tweaking and manipulation of web applications. Uh, it's not specifically what Google web developer experts do, uh, but I just know a lot of weird stuff about web stuff. I'm an old school video game hacker, and that's relevant here because when you're talking about how to defend your applications against people who are using them the way they were meant to be used, it is very much a game with somebody playing a different game than you want them to play. So you have to be able to understand their motivations uh, and influence them and direct them in ways that disincentivize their attacks going forward. You can't just close things like logins or create account forms. You have to keep them open and you have to figure out how to play a game with your attackers. You can find me uh, at JS Overson just about everywhere. Uh, I talk a lot about uh, web automation, reverse engineering, uh, JavaScript, and, and weird web stuff. So we're going to go through why credential stuffing is evolving, uh, how it is evolving, and where we go from here. First, credential stuffing is evolving for the same reason that anything evolves. There is incentive to keep on going, and there are people standing in the way. You can imagine uh, credential stuffing and attacks like that as one giant bucket of cash that sits in a room, uh, and all the defenses that we put up are just some things that stand in that way. The bucket of cash is not going away. You throw a moat around the bucket of cash, what you're doing is just saying, hey, only people who are willing to cross this mo moat can get this bucket of cash. So the, the way that we deal with this in general is by throwing defenses in the way. When there are no defenses, uh, there is virtually no cost to reaching in and grabbing money out of that bucket of cash. Every time we add any defense, what we're doing is increasing the cost of entry to further attacks. Uh, just like with the moat example, what you're doing is saying you have to be able to build a bridge here. You have to be able to jump over this moat. You have to be able to fly. Everyone who was doing what they were doing before, walking in and grabbing cash, you can't do that anymore. So it's the same thing with all sorts of attacks. The goal is to invalidate an entire class of attacks and basically say, hey, you've got to play a different game now if you want to keep on attacking us. The goal with these defenses is to get to a point where the cost and value are no longer in the attacker's favor. We keep on adding these layers of defenses, uh, trying to make the costs just attack, uh, just uh, trying to make the attacks cost just too much. Uh, when you get here, it feels good. You can prioritize working on other things. You can proactively deal with threats that you are no going to be coming down the line. Uh, the problem with staying here, though, is that just like with all other technology, uh, phones, uh, computing in general, cloud computing, machine learning, is that by doing nothing, it reduces in cost over time. Uh, normal use cases get optimized for, companies spin up uh, that lower the cost of everything, uh, the cost of technology just goes down because it gets easier to produce and use. Now the second problem here is that all of us exist at any company for one single purpose to increase the value of our company. There is very rarely a position that you can get into where your sole goal is to destroy the company from the inside. That, that doesn't happen very often. So you get this dynamic where costs of these attacks are dropping incredibly while all the same time our value of the accounts and the data that we hold is rising. So you get this massive, massive fuel to the fire of, of just generic manipulation of our applications, and it's causing massive, massive iteration. So credential stuffing, for anyone who needs a refresher, is the uh, replay of previously breached known credentials against just any other site that exists out there. Uh, it's one of those things that when you tell people about it, if they're not intimately aware of why it's a problem, they're like, eh. It's not that big of a deal. It's, a, it's the user's problem. They're reusing passwords. It's their fault. We don't need to worry about it. I get that. 
it sounds like an easy thing to push off, but when the scale of fraud is so massive, you can't ignore it. Now, the second way that people uh, easily ignore these things is that they think it's just too hard, not valuable enough to go through billions of credentials just to find a few accounts. So we're gonna go through uh, what it actually costs to execute a credential stuffing attack uh, so that we can all become intimately familiar with the pain that I deal with on a daily basis. First step, getting credentials. This used to be somewhat difficult. You had to run in the right groups, pay to be in the right groups, breach the credentials yourself, go around on shady dark websites doing whatever, grabbing combo lists, running through them. Now you can just go to a public website like raidforums.com, uh, go to a post like this. Uh, this is the uh, post on raid forums that uh, gave you a link to collections one, two, three, four, five, and the anti public mega leak. You had to unlock the link for eight credits, which at the time was about $2.50. Uh, it was more than I had in this account, but because it is just a torrent or magnet link or whatever else, you can find other posts that have that. I uh, And download literally billions of credentials for nothing. So the, the, all these collections, probably heard a lot about collection one, Troy Hunt uh, posted about it last January. Uh, collections two, three, four, and five, and, and the rest uh, got less news because when you're already talking about nearly 100 million credentials, like a few billion extras, like whatever, everything's out there, no one cares anymore. But this is crazy, billions of credentials from leaks all the way back to like 2009, 2010 are now accessible for literally nothing. So. Next up, if you're trying to go through a billion credentials, uh, is to get something to automate that for you. Uh, there just aren't enough hits to make it worth typing in billions of, of usernames and passwords by hand. So you've gotta do it automatically. This is a tool called Browser Automation Studio. This drives a full-featured Chrome. This is actually a Chrome instance in this window. And you can just click on these little widgety plugin things, fill out a few variables in configuration, and then create a visual logic flow for how to manipulate whatever site you want. This is pretty easy to get started with. It's not like back in the day where you had to learn how to program, you had to find the libraries, tie them all together, deal with all the bugs and edge cases yourself. You could just download a WYSIWYG application, pop in a few configuration variables, and automate whatever site you want. But also, time is money, and not all of us want to do that. So you can browse a legitimate site like Upwork.com and find somebody who's willing to do it for you. Uh, this is somebody advertising their services to configure Browser Automation Studio for $10 an hour. I would expect that most uh, lightly to moderately defended sites can be automated in about three to five hours. Uh, so that's about $30 to $50 if you wanted to get somebody to do that for you. Uh, and if you're looking to automate a whole bunch of sites, you might as well just pay a whole bunch of people so that you can get started tonight. Next up is to defeat whatever defenses exist. Uh, and there is inevitably something that exists out there because credential stuffing and automation is nothing new. We have probably seen this a billion times. This is Google's reCAPTCHA version two. Version two was the, the two squiggly letters uh, that Google told you uh, you would have to write in order to help them transcribe books and to help prove that you weren't a robot. Uh, now you get this little uh, swirly swirl and a green check mark if you look okay. Uh, if you don't look okay, then you get a grid of pictures where you have to compete against Google's machine learning algorithms to determine who knows the most about fire hydrants and buses and crosswalks. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the, the irony is not lost on me uh, that you're proving you're a robot uh, by playing a game with a robot that knows more about the stuff it's showing you to begin with. Uh, but the problem <laughs> with stuff like this is that everyone uses it. And if you have the same defense across a whole lot of valuable resources, it incentivizes people to break that defense. I mean, the same thing if you're a burglar and you're dealing with a neighborhood of uh, 1,000 houses over here and 1,000 houses over there. Uh, neighborhood A all has really, really good unique locks. Neighborhood B has all of the same type of really, really good lock. If you wanted to find out which lock you would break in order to get the maximum return, you would target the neighborhood that is all using the same exact type of lock. So then you get people who uh, prioritize defeating things like this. 
Uh, these are, this is one of literally dozens of CAPTCHA solvers that exist out there. Uh, you can Google CAPTCHA solvers and find a whole list of CAPTCHA solvers. Uh, Google's own algorithms will propagate uh, the, the top 10 best CAPTCHA solvers to the top of the search results. Uh, the Google Answers uh, API will, will answer automatically a whole bunch of questions about how to use CAPTCHA solvers. You can Google really, really easily how to bypass one of the most prominent defenses out there uh, because it just doesn't work. These CAPTCHAs just are, are so easy to bypass. This service offers uh, 1,000 solved CAPTCHAs for $1.39 or 99 cents for gold members. That is a fraction of a penny per solved CAPTCHA. That's nothing. That is not a cost that will disincentivize an attacker. So what this means, every time you're presented with some stupid little CAPTCHA out there, uh, that you are being burdened more than the attackers that are trying to be stopped. Uh, the way these work, uh, they started by taking the CAPTCHA images and then sending it to a whole list of human contractors who would just get a list of images. They would type out the solution. The solution would go back to the API. The API would deliver that solution to the consumer. And every uh, person or every uh, CAPTCHA that was solved would net the contractor a fraction of a penny. So they would solve a task that was only supposed to be solvable by humans by using humans. These people are creative. They do good jobs getting around things uh, that are fun to get around. Next up is to distribute globally. Uh, this is something that you have to do because uh, anyone deal with managing their own server or working as a network admin or sysadmin at some point? And I, I did ages ago. And when you see millions of requests from an IP address, what do you do? Block it at the start or rate limit or something like that. We've all done that. We've all done similar things. It's like you see something, it's like, ha, ah, block it, and then it goes away. It's like, yes, I did it. All it did was hide from you uh, by distributing its traffic all over the globe. Uh, this used to be somewhat costly and difficult, too. You had to have these computers that would be running all over the world or proxying all over the world. Uh, but now there are millions of proxies available, proxy services that do all this for you. Uh, and if that's not enough, then there are also things like Google Cloud, Azure, AWS, DigitalOcean, uh, services designed to take your code and distribute it all around the globe, coming from a whole bunch of different IP addresses. Uh, it, is, it costs virtually nothing to send millions of requests from thousands of IP addresses. Something like Google Cloud Functions actually gives you the first two million invocations of the function for free. And that's a lot of code all around the world. So with all those numbers and all that stuff we're talking about, we can figure out the cost of this attack. Uh, it's nothing for billions of credentials. Uh, zero to 50 bucks, depending on your uh, determination and dedication to get a tool running. Uh, you could, if you're dealing with CAPTCHAs, you can use Death by CAPTCHA. If you're a gold member, it drops to $99. Uh, there are other solutions that are uh, cheap or free, but have lower success rates. Um, and for, I mean, IP addresses, you can spend as much as you want, uh, depending on your needs. You can spend nothing uh, until you get blocked, and then as you get blocked, you iterate on how you're gonna go through the, the IP rotation process. So what it amounts to is uh, two-tenths of a United States penny at most to, uh, to issue each account takeover attempt uh, tested credentials uh, for a large-scale uh, credential stuffing attack, 100,000. Um, that's cheap, but what's the value you get out of these attacks? The accounts that I see on account reseller marketplaces typically range between $2 and $150. The lower uh, value accounts, uh, things like fan forums for, for musical artists, uh, video games uh, where the, the accounts don't have uh, many skins or digital goods or anything like that. Higher value accounts, obviously banks, uh, anything where there is physical money that can be drained. Anywhere where you can transfer money goes for a lot on account reseller marketplaces because it facilitates uh, money laundering and advanced fraud. The success rates that we see at Shape Security uh, are between 0.2 and 2% for the Fortune 500. Uh, Junaid Ali from uh, Cloudflare, who helped with Pwn Passwords, mentioned that success rates that they see for sites like WordPress can jump as high as 35%. 
So it's, it's a range. It depends on the site you're targeting um, and the, the freshness of the credentials you have. And then we already went through the cost, plug this into uh, the ROI function, and you get a return of, at the low end, 100%, and the high end, basically unlimited money. It just, it, there is a massive, massive return on successful credential stuffing attacks. You see a lot uh, of talk about how the stock market has been doing in the past few years um, from people who tweet a lot. And uh, my recommendation, if you are looking to, to make a lot of money, take all your money out of the stock market and dump it into credential stuffing. The return is insane, and this is fueling massive, massive iteration. So how credential stuffing has evolved. I've cut this up into two uh, to three major generations uh, as the historical era, uh, which uh, is the time between the first credential spill, uh, whenever that happened, probably at the start of passwords, uh, and then about 2015, uh, when companies really started to be aware that this was a massive problem. So in the early days, when there were literally no defenses, the easiest tool wins. Uh, and what won was the easiest tool. I uh, just use curl wget and hammer away at, at uh, post, uh, post requests and just test your credentials, uh, scrape the response, find some success criteria, pipe all those uh, successes into another file and you've got a credential stuffing attack with a list of valid accounts. As this started to heat up, you started to find uh, more specific tools tailored for the attack at a play. This is one of the most popular tools uh, that was, I believe released around 2009, but I can't get an, a, a fully accurate date on that. Uh, this, is, this is a pretty basic tool. It's highly, highly configurable, uh, but it's still at the HTTP level. It, it automates and abstracts all the tedium of, of uh, credential stuffing, uh, dealing with combo lists, massive, massive files of username and, and password pairs, uh, dealing with bypassing some defenses that we'll get into so that you can just take a configuration, uh, throw it a combo list, and then out comes the other side, a whole bunch of valid credentials. Early defense, uh, we already went over a little bit, IP rate limiting. Uh, it's just the natural instinct when you see abuse coming in from one source is to limit the amount of damage that network resource can inflict on your architecture. All that does in this case is just uh, hide the, the attack because it, attackers go through and start rotating through proxies. This first iteration was actually probably the most beneficial for people who were executing these attacks because it allowed these attacks to go unnoticed for almost decades. Because when you started to get this traffic distributed all around the globe and it just looked like a bunch of spikes in traffic, uh, making your traf traffic graphs all wiggly and unpredictable, uh, it, it allowed all these attacks to just, just continue uh, without really getting substantial blocks. The first defense specifically tailored to defeating automated behavior was the CAPTCHA, the completely automated public Turing test against uh, computer, uh, the pu Hold on. dealing with acronyms when I'm in front of people is a whole different problem. Completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. It is a, it is a long one. Um, and this was incredibly successful. This was uh, so successful, it spread like wildfire. Everyone started using it, and it was great. It stopped everything for probably a few weeks. Uh, it didn't stop it from just spreading all across the globe and having people trust in it because it sounded like a good idea, but we already know how these were bypassed uh, very, very quickly. Next uh, defense came from uh, the natural evolution of the internet. As JavaScript became a lot more prevalent and commonplace on a lot of major websites, all tools that could only understand HTML broke. And they stagnated and, and uh, a lot of them died if they didn't evolve. So just by sites going more dynamic uh, without any additional defenses uh, was a, a protection in itself. And then with JavaScript available to uh, anything on the page, it enabled more advanced defenses on the client side. Uh, this is the, the grid portion of Google's reCAPTCHA version two. And the evolution past this point required substantial effort in understanding web technology. Now, 
As an attacker, when you're looking to do the cheapest possible thing to get forward, you're not going to be implementing an entire browser engine yourself. Luckily, uh, there were developers who were taking uh, what are known as web views, uh, wrapping them into easy to use high level APIs that allowed anyone to iterate with browser technology quickly. Things like PhantomJS and TrifleJS. Uh, web views, uh, for anyone who's not aware, uh, are those programming components uh, that you can embed in other apps, basically said, essentially embed a browser inside another application. Uh, it's the same stuff that, that uh, Facebook uses to keep you in Facebook's app when you're browsing web pages. So developers uh, took those web views uh, and then just wrapped them up into uh, a easy to use API so that people can script these much more easily. This gave attackers the ability to completely understand and bypass a lot of naive defenses just by using browser technology. So when you have uh, essentially browsers that look like other browsers, it becomes harder to detect and block them. What became common uh, was looking for nuances in the metadata in the uh, actual network requests themselves. When you have different tools implemented differently with different network stacks uh, and libraries, there will be differences in how uh, requests are formed that are still spec compliant, but are just different. For example, Chrome will always put its host header right at the top. PhantomJS always puts its host header at the bottom. So just by looking at the order of where the host header is, you can identify an entire class of tool. And for tools like PhantomJS, where the amount of fraud is astronomical and the amount of legitimate use is so tiny, it becomes easy to just block entire tools. So this is where the strategy from attackers shifts. So at this point, attack tools themselves, uh, well, attacks themselves need to be using browser technology. And entire tools that are easy to use for attackers are being blocked because there's just more fraud usage than legitimate usage. The next iterations uh, change by looking more close to actual users. So the next iteration is by is actually scripting consumer browsers. Firefox, the same Firefox you would download from Firefox.com, the same Chrome that you would download from Chrome.com or, or get, I don't know, whatever the URL is. Uh, started with things like Selenium, uh, now Puppeteer is, is a very popular one. Playwright, I believe, was recently released. These are libraries that developers write for other developers that allow them to script and automate browser behavior. Uh, this is obviously not created for attacks uh, specifically. This is for testing websites, uh, doing fancy new things with, uh, with web pages. But anything that automates uh, anything can be used by attackers looking to automate behavior. Now attack tools themselves drive the browsers directly. Uh, Selenium and Puppeteer uh, and things like that are used for, uh, for, for emerging attacks that specific attack tools no longer uh, or don't support yet. Next defense is fingerprinting the source of the attack. So uh, I'm an attacker. I have a handful of computers, maybe one, maybe a few, maybe some virtual machines, instances, whatever else. I don't have many because I don't want to spend much money. This is still a cost versus value game. I want to go as cheap as possible. I'm still distributing my traffic across thousands or millions of different IP addresses, but still using a few central computers and browsers. If you can identify the source of that traffic at the computer or the browser, then you can identify an entire attack campaign regardless of how distributed it is. This is the idea behind browser fingerprinting. Uh, it, it, it is JavaScript and, and uh, you can also do client fingerprinting on devices and whatever else, but the idea is to collect a whole bunch of variable data across computers, smash it all up together, and get something that is reasonably unique. Stuff like your screen resolution, browser size, the fonts you have installed, the plugins you have installed, how your video card works, whatever else. All those things are different with all your different configurations. And when you put those all together, you get something that is similar to a fingerprint. Uh, it's the same technology that ad trackers use to track uh, you searching for uh, kitten adoption over here to sell you kitty litter over there. Uh, but because this is essentially repurposed ad technology, there is a whole bunch of precedent that exists uh, to block 
trackers uh, for privacy-minded individuals. Uh, there's uh, services uh, like FraudFox, uh, which is the, the ultimate in internet privacy. Good job. Virtual machine-based solution to beat browser fingerprinting. Uh, so you can use the internet safely. Uh, this defeats browser fingerprinting by randomizing all of those fingerprintable data points so that you get essentially a new fingerprint every time. Fingerprints are only useful if they don't change. Uh, no CSI or Hollywood show would care about fingerprints if an attacker could just go home and swipe off their fingerprints and put new ones on. Uh, there's a whole load of stuff out there. Um, and granted, this is touting itself as a privacy browser where you can use the internet safely. Calls itself FraudFox. So I mean, you, you can see where the, where the motivations lie. Uh, and that's because there's just so much profit associated with these types of attacks. Uh, who cares about privacy nerds when you can just sell to people looking to commit fraud? Now, the, the next defense is analyzing user behavior for negative traits, bot traits. Uh, again, cheapest possible thing works. Attackers or anyone looking to do anything isn't going to do more than they have to. So using all these tools, you're going to get very, very basic behavior. Uh, you're going to get entire usernames and passwords input within a millisecond. You're going to get uh, mouse movements that just jerk from location to click, look, look, location to location, and maybe don't even click. Uh, you'll get uh, partial keyboard events. Uh, you won't get the key down, key press, key up event. You'll just get the key press event or something like that. When you start looking at user behavior, uh, it becomes very, very clear what is probably a human and what is probably a bot. If something is clicking consistently at the 0, 0 xy coordinate every time there's a click, it's probably not a human. And this is where the strategy in attackers is going. There is a whole range of legitimacy for uh, traffic coming into any site. There is a legitimate, very, very clearly legitimate traffic and very, very clearly illegitimate traffic. But there is a gray area in between where false positives run rampant, uh, where traffic from edge case users has attack-like qualities. So people who use assist assistive, assistive devices, like screen readers, uh, who only use their keyboard, don't use a mouse, are using out-of-date OSs, out-of-date computers, uh, weird configurations, those are people uh, who look potentially attack-like. Taken individually, they are a very, very small percentage. Taken as a group, it is a large enough percentage to uh, make blocking accidentally very, very painful. So attackers are moving to stay within that gray area. So when, you are, when every defense blocks something uh, that identifies an attacker as clearly illegitimate, the next step is to move a little bit closer to that gray area. So when you are looking obviously bot-like uh, because of your user behavior, you will start generating legitimate human behavior. This is Browser Automation Studio. This is a programmatically controlled uh, browser. You notice here that the mouse is casually meandering across the page. Uh, it's just stopping there for a little bit. Might be doing some clicks here and there. Uh, it'll eventually go back to the next thing, click next. Uh, apparently, Google user at gmail.com is not a legitimate account. Um, but this is, this is where the attacks are going. You don't have to look 100% human. You just have to look human enough to get into that gray area where you can't be easily blocked. Next step is to uh, identify and count up all the lies that an attacker is telling you. Again, I've only got a few computers. I've only got a few browsers. Uh, it's too hard to actually, uh, it is too hard to uh, actually have the thousands of different OS and browser combinations to, to make up actual demographics across the world. So I have to just pretend that I am uh, a latest version of Chrome, the last version of Chrome a few months ago, uh, Internet Explorer, iOS Safari, whatever else, uh, in order to make it look like my traffic is coming from a bunch of different IPs and a bunch of different user agents. Now, user agents are exposed via the user agent header in, in HTTP headers. We all know that you can't trust that somebody is accurately telling you that user agent. Uh, but what you can do is uh, identify all the lies that uh, they're telling you that expose if they are definitely not that user agent. 
So something like uh, browser support for certain features that have come up over the years. Aug Vorbis is an open source audio technology that is supported uh, by Firefox, Chrome, and now Edge, not supported in Safari or Internet Explorer. Now, if you tell me your Internet Explorer uh, or Safari, but you support Aug Vorbis, then you are lying. One lie or a few lies is not enough to block somebody, but if you are lying a lot, like an attacker would need to in order to, uh, to properly distribute their traffic realistically, then it's easy to block somebody who's just lying a lot. Next step here for attackers is to just use real device data. So an interrogation like I was just talking about amounts to a whole bunch of questions that a defender is asking an attacker. Now, if you uh, reverse engineer the JavaScript and you get all of the, those questions being asked, you can just ask those questions of legitimate devices, get all those legitimate answers, and now rotate through those whenever you are asked those questions again so that you can have consistent answers all the way across. Whew. Well, this keeps on going, uh, but f uh, because it's relatively soon in some of the, the next iterations, we're not going to talk deeply about them, but the path is similar you are getting closer and closer to complete imitation of the users that are actually using your site. Uh, we're calling these imitation attacks. I know, if I was in the audience uh, and I saw somebody at some newfangled uh, security company talking about some new term, I would groan, and you can groan too, it's, it's okay. You don't need to use this term. We needed a term to differentiate automation and what we're talking about. Not all automation is an imitation attack. Not all imitation attacks are automated. Uh, they are descriptive of attackers who are motivated and incentivized to uh, continually iterate past, past and automation and risk-based defenses in order to get to your, uh, your individual users. Where do we go from here? Actually, this is a good time to stop for questions uh, before I close this out, because we went through a lot, uh, and questions at the end of talks are always kind of weird and annoying anyway. So let's go after a few questions here, uh, one or two questions, and then I will close out. And this is high-level stuff. If anyone wants to talk about deep details or nerd out on some of the things, I'll be right out there afterward. I love the weird nerd stuff at the bottom. This is cool, great, but if you want to get deep with anything, uh, please talk to me. I'm here uh, for the rest of the conference, and this is what I do. Uh, you got a question? Yeah, so really two questions, or two different technologies I was hoping to hear about, just like proactive you know, prevention of credential stuffing attacks on the user side, where that factors in, as well as uh, just MFA. Uh, MFA, I would love to talk about. Uh, it is uh, because there are so many different types of factors. Some are better than others. Uh, in general, uh, first off, MFA, always turn it on. I don't think I need to say that here. Um, uh, motivated attackers will still find ways around lots of uh, uh, different types of authentication step-ups. Um, Hardware-based multi-factor authentication uh, is still very, very, very effective and that is probably going to be your best bet. And as a user, have unique passwords for every site. Every site, not just the important ones, everyone. Uh, use a password manager. Uh, I use one password. Uh, very, very important, and uh, it's annoying, but that's what we gotta do. But how far, or how prevalent is that? Are you seeing in the, just like on the defensive side? How many people use password managers? Uh, not even people, just like organizations enforcing this. We, uh, I, I gave uh, stats to Troy Hunt at one point, I think he wrote something about it. I forget the exact numbers, but they were dismal. It was like less than, point one, or less than 1% for the vast majority of users uh, on the internet use password managers. We track those as part of Shape because we've got a bunch of JavaScript on the page, we track browser interactions, uh, and we can see how these plugins interact, uh, and we see very, very little. Doesn't mean you shouldn't use that, obviously. Even this is a good crowd. You're all good people. You know Thank what you. to do. Uh, maybe one more question before I close out. All right, back. Um, real quick, with the iterations and your experience, where would you say maybe the median or the 75th percentile is of companies? defenses, like what iteration are most companies defending against at this point versus 
the iterations we're actually on? A large number of solutions out there are around the, uh, the negative user behavior and browser fingerprinting level. Uh, browser fingerprinting is one of those uh, techniques that is easy to get into. It sounds promising um, because you can see the next few stages of iteration uh, past the first bypass from an attacker. The problem is though, uh, once you get to the more sophisticated attackers, uh, you just get into a whack-a-mole game of updating browser fingerprint signatures, rate limits, and whatever else. It's just, it's, it's IP rate limiting with uh, browser metadata instead of uh, network level metadata. Uh, and it's, it's not effective, but it's, it's promising and alluring to uh, companies, uh, both startups trying to solve this and companies trying to build their own solution. Uh, and that is where a lot of solutions are, are still stuck. All right, uh, again, available for questions uh, uh, right outside afterward. Uh, but let's move on to where we go from here. So the value in accounts is not going away. Uh, that, that big bucket of cash uh, is still sitting there and getting bigger by the day. Uh, I can imagine that a lot of people in this room uh, uh, would probably be perfectly okay if the bucket of cash shrunk because it would make our jobs a lot easier. Uh, that's not happening. The cost of credential stuffing, on the other hand, for the more progressive, highly defended companies is raising a lot. Not so much that it completely dissuades credential stuffing, but it is incentivizing new types of attacks to get to accounts. Genesis is an early example of what we're seeing uh, to be the top tier of alternate account takeover attacks. So Genesis is uh, a uh, malware that resides on the computer. It is a marketplace and it is a plugin for browsers. So this uh, has, uh, at the time this was taken, which is actually several months ago, uh, it was 100,000 uh, different bots that exist on people's computers. And each one of these bots uh, scrapes whatever it can find. Uh, credentials that you input on browsers, uh, session cookies, uh, uh, sites you go to, anything you log into, whatever it can find, it scrapes and uploads to the marketplace as one individual thing that you can purchase for $81.50, $52, whatever else. Each one of these bots is a person or a, a computer. So uh, this one is scraping a whole bunch of Netflix, uh, Netflix stuff, Facebook stuff, Amazon stuff, Google stuff, uh, Dropbox accounts, PayPal accounts, Spotify, eBay, Instagram, Cisco, Skype, Capital One, Twitter, TD Bank, Groupon, Yahoo, uh, a whole bunch of accounts. And I can buy this bot. If it's yours, I buy you. I get sold you. No one else can buy you. I control what I do with all that information. The bot's still there. As you change passwords, I get the new ones. As you get new accounts, I get the new ones. And I can manipulate you in ways that I see are appropriate. I can go fishing much more confidently and, and uh, convincingly when I have all this information. I can drain accounts. I can do whatever I want. Um, there are uh, risk-based uh, authentication step-up mechanisms. Uh, if I log in from a new computer or, or, or some new access point, I will be uh, told I need to input a new token or do something to confirm my identity. Uh, solutions like this take care of that by scraping all the environment information on the host or the victim's computer and allowing you to propagate all that into the Genesis plugin. So you can get all the cookies that you need, the fingerprints, uh, what, what uh, uh, OS you're trying to, to appear like you were coming from generate the fingerprint that gets loaded into the <coughs> plugin, uh, and then look like your victim. So if you look like you're coming from the computer and browser that the victim normally comes to, you are very, very likely not going to get that step up authentication. So you can soar right past all those risk scoring mechanisms that are designed to block us and reduce user friction by not being a pain every time we try to log in. So to close, uh, credential stuffing is a human problem, not a technical one. There are no silver bullets against humans, unless literally silver bullets, which is a different discussion. Um, this, is, this is advanced and sophisticated fraud that many fraud teams are not set up to respond appropriately with. 
A lot of fraud teams are very, very retroactive. Uh, they find things uh, down the line, piece together where it came from, attribute the, the source, uh, and then they write off those numbers because they can't do anything about it. This is fraud that's happening on the applications that our developers are building, and they need, fraud teams need better tools to understand this stuff and to mitigate it earlier and faster. Uh, imitation attacks are designed to blend in. If you don't think you have a problem, make sure you don't have a problem. Uh, at Shape Security, when we started a long, long time ago, this was a very, very big problem. We knew credential stuffing was an issue, but when we're going to companies like, hey, we're gonna sell you something that takes care of a problem you don't think you have and you have to pay us a lot of money, it was hard to get started. It was around 2015. Uh, companies were not entirely aware of the problem. Only the most progressive ones uh, started to buy into this uh, problem, but now everyone is aware that there is massive amounts of automation that is hiding in our normal user's traffic and it's hard to identify. Uh, and attackers are economically driven. Every single defense will fail uh, if your bucket of cash is still there in their view. And I work at a company that specifically says, hey, we protect you from all this stuff. Uh, we fail all the time. It's how we adapt and move forward and evolve that makes a difference. So any company, uh, no matter what vendor you use, no matter what you build, that defense is going to fail because you're just too valuable. It's a good thing, it's a badge of honor, yay. Uh, but it does mean that you have to be in this for the long term. You have to properly fund the problem. You have to have the headcount you need. And you have to be able to admit that when defenses fail, it's not necessarily a failure on the company, it is the natural evolution of these attacks and you have to move on. And thank you very much. So once again, Jared Overson uh, from Shape Security, uh, which I mean actually uh, as of December 19th last year, uh, F5 has, uh, has uh, put in the attempt to acquire Shape. So you might see uh, people like us talking about these things under the name F5. And if there's anyone from F5 here, please uh, come so I can hug you because you're family now, I guess. <laughs> All right, not yet, uh, but when things close. Thank you very much. <laughs>